Okay, hi there and welcome to a macroeconomics revision video focusing on evaluating the advantages and disadvantages of FDI for developing countries. FDI is pretty huge globally and if we just take developing countries in 2017, FDI flows were over $670 billion. Just over $40 billion went to Africa, but that was down nearly a fifth uh, in 2017 compared to the year before, particularly amongst commodity exporting countries, and reflects the, the key point that FDI is not guaranteed, it is often quite volatile. However, it, it is the biggest source of inflow of external finance for developing countries. Remittances are second, and debt and portfolio flows third, overseas aid fourth now. Here's a couple of good examples of countries that have received significant inflows of FDI. Morocco, particularly in the energy sector, Egypt, Nigeria, Ghana, and Ethiopia, particularly in manufacturing. Always good to have a couple of examples to go into the exam with. Now, one key evaluation point right at the start, top left of this slide. FDI can have important demand and supply side benefits for the least developed countries. So you can use an aggregate demand and supply diagram to get good analysis marks, or you could use a PPF diagram if you wanted to, but it's important to recognize the demand and the supply side effects of FDI. What are some of the advantages of FDI? Let me take you through some key points. First of all, it can create stronger GDP growth and create new jobs. In particular, if you're adding to the capital stock, in theory, FDI can lift a country's productivity. That increases GNI per capita and consumption per head and therefore helps to reduce extreme poverty. Second point is that a capital inflow coming in in the form of FDI helps to finance a current account deficit. Don't forget FDI is an inflow on the financial account. Many sub-Saharan African countries, for example, run quite large current account deficits. Well, FDI, if they can attract it, is a way of, of balancing their external account. And then going forward, FDI can lead to higher exports from the host country, the country that attracts the FDI. Uh, so, for example, you allow foreign firms to locate in a special economic zone. They do some manufacturing in that zone and then re-export their products to other countries. Not only is it therefore add to GDP, but it uh, adds to the export uh, values as well. In theory, FDI can generate important tax revenues for a host country. And if they take their corporate social responsibility policy seriously, investment from overseas can lead to higher wages, improved working conditions. And if people have higher wages, they therefore have more ability to save. Again, over the, over the long term, FDI can increase the stock of human capital in a country and if training is improved and uh, people uh, and the country benefits from technology and know-how spillover effects, if you like, externalities, then FDI is one means by which you can diversify the economy by increasing the capabilities of the labour market. And also FDI can create more competition in markets, particularly if there was limited competition beforehand. So an increase in the contestability of markets might then reduce the price for consumers. For example, FDI in the energy sector. And if prices go down, then the real incomes of consumers go up. So quite a few advantages mentioned here. You might you obviously you won't have time to talk about all of these in an exam. So you might have to bring them together in, 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 in a couple of uh, chunky paragraphs. However, of course, as part of evaluation, there are some drawbacks, some risks of countries becoming reliant on FDI. First point is that a lot of TNCs, particularly multinationals from developed countries, they have a significant power, monopoly and monopsony power, and they may well use that economic influence, uh, that financial strength to gain favourable laws, perhaps some favourable tax exemptions or regulations, which might not have been otherwise available to them. Big debates, of course, about ethical standards from TNCs. One thinks about disasters at, uh, for example, the Rana Plaza factory in Bangladesh a few years ago. If you think about industries such as mining and farming and textiles, the ethical standards of TNCs are not always as good as they should be. 
And there's always the risk, of course, that FDI focused on extractive industries, from mining to farming, uh, could lead to some environmental negative externalities, some environmental consequences. For example, deforestation and overfishing. Third point is that the profits made in uh, an LEDC are often repatriated back to the host country, lowering GNI per capita and worsening the current account. There are doubts too about the extent to which FDI necessarily creates lots of good new jobs, particularly if FDI focuses on extractive sectors such as copper mining, which tends to be fairly capital intensive rather than labour intensive. And then, there's, and then there's the issue about which types of labour is being employed locally. Is it essentially labour to assemble products, assemble an iPhone, for example, or assemble a, uh, some, some textiles? Or is it an opportunity for local people to, to develop senior roles in management? Uh, the big issue is the quality of the jobs created. And then there's a link with inequality. Profits from FDIs, uh, the, the money made may well flow disproportionately to powerful elites within the country. So it depends on the level of corruption, but there could be some significant extractive rent-seeking and the benefits of FDI don't necessarily have a widely distributed across the bulk of the population. So you can also make an inequality point. Now my key evaluation points are really as follows. We talk about the multiplier effect from FDI, but that value is by necessity, by necessity uncertain. We don't know the size of the multiplier. Secondly, a crucial valuation point really is whether the TNCs who locate in another country, they pay a sufficient rate of tax, corporation tax, for example, if their projects are profitable. So the extent of the fiscal dividend for the, the country receiving the FDI depends on whether these corporations pay their taxes. Key point. However, FDI is now significantly more important than remittances. It's more volatile than remittances, but FDI is a major way for the least developed countries in particular to help overcome a savings gap and drive, drive investment and growth. Another couple of points. Uh, one is that if, if FDI is a significant share of GDP each year, let's say 3 4 5% every year, that inflow of money from overseas could cause a currency appreciation, which then might make other exporting businesses in the country less price competitive. So FDI, in that sense, might crowd out local producers through a currency appreciation. For me, the fundamental long-term issue, the big question, is whether FDI promotes diversification. So uh, this is a potential way of overcoming primary product dependency. Does FDI increase the capabilities and the capacity of the host country in the long term? If it does, in my opinion, the long term benefits exceed the risks and the costs. Here's just a really good way of just thinking about how you evaluate in an exam. You make your point. So, for example, there's a positive multiplier effect from FDI. However, it depends on the size and the extent of the multiplier, and that depends on many factors. FDI can create technology transfers and technology spillovers. However, uh, it depends on the product and the quality of jobs created. FDI can help to increase GDP and exports, but there may be a long-term environmental cost which makes growth unsustainable. And FDI creates extra employment for domestic workers, but in many cases, for example, Chinese companies in Africa, the TNC may bring many of their own skilled workers into the recipient countries. All the time we're thinking about advantages, disadvantages, you know, this evaluative way of thinking we know, don't we, is the way to get top marks in an exam. A couple of very recent examples. I love following James Hall. Hall about Africa is just quite stunning on Twitter about the African continent. He is, uh, he is one of the best things on the social media platform, I think. A couple of examples. Very recent ones, actually. Uh, the first one, the left-hand side, concerns Gambia. So FDI into tourism can be a significant growth enhancer and employment creator. And in Gambia, tourism provides 19% of all employment in the country. Crucial thing there is to lift the skills, the human capital of the, of the workers in the industry to, to really grow the, the sector. And on the right-hand side, just a simply fantastic example from Rwanda. 
you know, we've been, what was it, 25 years since the genocide. Fast growing country in East Africa. Uh, African country ends imports by making its own. So Rwanda is now producing enough fertilizer, a fertilizer plant starting operating this year to reduce their imports of fertilizer and create a surplus for export. Now, if that fertilizer plant has some foreign direct investment, that will be a terrific example to use because it allows you to reduce your import demand. And if you create sufficient surplus capacity, surplus output, you can then export it. The strength impact on the balance of payments current account could be noticeable. There we go. Some of the advantages and disadvantages of FDI.